if you image someone and we can go through what that might look like and they they do have atherosclerosis they have elevated ldl cholesterol are you is that person automatically classified as you know borderline to intermediate high or very high risk based on just the presence of atherosclerosis well there's you know we we designate the presence of atherosclerosis differently um we, we use the term plaque so plaque is a quantitative measure of atherosclerosis everybody in this room right now has atherosclerosis but not all of us necessarily have plaque so you can have sort of a pre-plaque where this process is going on it's a fatty streak but it's not quite raised to the level of plaque so there's a quantitative difference some of our tools can distinguish between those things but if you're in this phase if you're in a stage in your life where all you have is fatty streaks sure you can definitely treat that with medicine but the urgency to start medicine to treat that is less because the short-term risk is less but if the individual who has that says i don't like that i have that i want to fix this one of the tools at your disposal is reduce the ldl and you can reduce it with medicine or find some other mechanism to reduce it but it's not an arm twisting class 1a guideline based recommendation to treat somebody and you would pick up the fatty streak in the and plaque with a ct angiogram no fatty streak you requires a autopsy okay. so <laughs> right. we generally don't yeah. do that with our patients so well, that makes sense cuz yeah. <laughs> I, I think i've read some studies where they reported that in in you know infants yeah right that were i think killed in the car accidents exactly yeah the um the p day study was uh is an old study that you know used autopsy reports of uh, pediatric aged individuals and adolescents and showed the presence of atherosclerosis in in youth and it's um you know it's horrifying but it is evidence that tells us that atherosclerosis starts early and is ubiquitous and um but so we don't treat everybody with atherosclerosis we treat we but you ought to treat everybody who has plaque so you know the character the 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 national guidelines characterize individuals in four different ways are have you are you familiar with this no the 2013 cholesterol guidelines refer to them as statin eligible treatment groups the 2018 guidelines carried them forward but um, now that we have evidence from non statins uh, in their ability to reduce risk uh, with other ldl lowering approaches can't really refer to them as statin statin treatment groups anymore but they that is essentially where they came from so there's four groups we have the secondary prevention groups the people with established cardiovascular disease we have individuals who ha- who look like they have an inherited we have adults over the age of 20 who look like they have an inherited cholesterol syndrome or severely acquired causes of high ldl cholesterol so their ldl cholesterol is greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter the writing group in 2013 thought that was a metric that called out a separate entity of people who have an inherited risk for cardiovascular disease on the basis of their ldl cholesterol alone and that that group should be offered treatment with you know high intensity statin therapy as first line first line approach we have our adult diabetics between the ages of 40 and 75 years old who um don't have ldl cholesterols over 190 in fact their ldl cholesterols can be between 70 and 189 mg per deciliter they felt that that which is basically the entire population of all diabetics uh, between the ages of 40 and 75 they thought that you know the clinical trial evidence supported the use of statins in that population and then there's pretty much everybody else should be considered for whether or not they should consider medicine to reduce their cardiovascular risk and that is all adults between the ages of 40 and 75 years old who don't have heart disease who don't have a high ldl cholesterol and who don't have diabetes and that's where we use our risk calculators and things like imaging to help assess how much plaque they have and how aggressively you'd want to treat them and there are features that you know there are some individuals who have personal features that are that that aren't captured by risk calculators like family history of early heart disease is not captured in risk calculators 
Uh, neither is having had preeclampsia during pregnancy. Neither is having chronic kidney disease and a whole host of other so-called risk enhancing factors where if there's some, if you have one of those features, it doesn't necessarily mean you qualify for pharmacologic therapy with statins or, or other LDL lowering, but it does suggest that you were underrepresenting your risk and that if you fall into an intermediate cate category of risk, they thought that the evidence was strong enough to actually recommend the use of coronary artery calcium scoring in adults in that age group to look for signs of enough atherosclerosis to justify pharmacologic treatment. But that's where the evidence lay in 2018. We now have like expanded age categories and expanded risk calculators that start as early as age 30. That's, that's a big improvement. I mean, that's a whole decade more of individuals who we may have been leaving behind. Um, we recognize that um, imaging is a really important part of decision-making. And you, we know that imaging can be used. There's lots of different modalities that you can consider to, as part of your decision-making. Some they, There's different features of the different imaging studies. So you have to pick the right one for the right person. When would you use the CT angiogram in clinic versus a, a coronary artery calcium score? Access to CT angiogram right now is a privileged thing. Um, I would love to see a CT angiogram in anybody I have concerns about the amount of atherosclerosis they have. What's a CT angiogram cost? Roughly. Uh, roughly over $1,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it varies, I think, by institution. And does insurance cover that if you meet a certain kind of risk profile? No. It covers it if you're using it to assess for ischemic symptoms. So it, it's a, it's a uh, recommended tool to evaluate somebody who has symptomatic conditions. I, I don't know what all of the diagnostic codes are that will justify it to an insurance company, but it can be a tool to understand why somebody is having chest pain, for example. But in somebody who doesn't have any cardiorespiratory limitations and does not have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and just wants to know like, gee, I wonder how much atherosclerosis I have and whether or not it's plaque that looks unstable and fragile and has features that put me at short-term high risk, that's going to be an out-of-pocket expense in the United States and I presume almost everywhere. And so... There are patients who come in and say, oh, that's okay. Oh, well, it's only $1,000, no problem. I'll, I'll take one and I'll take one for my spouse also. Um, and you can learn f how to manage their care based upon the, the information you get. It is probably the best non-invasive tool to know how much atherosclerosis and, to, and what the nature of their atherosclerosis is in their coronary vasculature. Absolutely. Well, but it's not practical. Wonder if they run uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales. You, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so every institution probably charges around the same ballpark, but it's a it's a terrific tool. It's safe. It's well validated. It's the amount of intravenous contrast is really quite low. You have to give a. We, we usually at, at my institution we give uh, two doses of oral beta blockers just to slow the heart rate down enough so that you can enhance the image that that they get. But that's a technical thing. And uh, it's, it's terrific information. There's software packages that enhance the information that is available so that not only can you look at flow limitation in the coronary arteries, which can impact decision making, not just about uh, short-term treatment, but also about long-term treatment. And then that software packages also enable information about plaque morphology. We're not quite sure how to use that yet, but I think those of us in the field sort of we think that that may turn out to be important and we're going to learn more about that. And I should disclose that I'm on, you know, uh, I'm a consultant for a company and participating in a clinical trial where we're trying to assess that very thing. So one of there's, there's a couple of companies that have software packages that enhance CT angiogram for that purpose. Um, so I, we don't use that much CT angiogram because I don't have that many patients who, for, for this purpose, I don't have that many patients who come in and say, oh yeah, I'll pay that dollar amount for, for that information. 
but we use a ton of coronary artery calcium scoring and far less, but still some carotid intimal medial thickness testing. So those are two imaging modalities that we use. And the one I use the most is the coronary artery calcium score. So that's a gated a CAT scan that's gated to your electrocardiogram so that you take the picture at the right time. It's a tool that estimates how much plaque you have by looking at how much crusty plaque you have. So it's a coronary artery calcium score. It's looking at the amount of calcified plaque in your coronary arteries. If you have significant atherosclerosis and plaque buildup, you're going to have a some of that is going to be calcified, calcified. And the longer you have that plaque, meaning the older you are, the higher the percentage of plaque is calcified. Is that an informative uh, test to do for someone who's in like their 20s or 30s or 40s, or does it require uh, more time to kind of see calcification? It definitely has greater value the older the person. Um, you it has it can have value in a younger person but it doesn't have much if any negative predictive value in a younger person so the test itself can either have negative predictive value or positive predictive value meaning that if you're 30 and you do it and you have no calcification that doesn't mean you're low risk exactly because at, at age 30 while you can do it and and uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I, I believe less than 5% of the population is going to have calcified plaque at age 30. And if so if you have calcified plaque at age 30, that means that you are, you are developing atherosclerosis at a highly accelerated rate and faster than 95% of the population. Whereas if you see a seven-year-old and they have no plaque, that's, that's a pretty good Fa sign that they're low risk. Yeah, that's fantastic. Negative predictive value in a 70-year-old. Right. I think, you know, it's commonly referred to as the power of zero. So a, the power of a zero coronary artery calcium score in a person who's old enough where that is really important indicator of, of their, their short-term risk. If they're old enough, do you really care what they're, you know, their 30-year risk What age do you think that is, is? where, where it, it it becomes very predictive that they're not going to develop atherosclerosis and that's not going to kill them. Well, those are different things, but I, <laughs> I think, you know, a calcium score of zero at age 50 starts to have some comfort at age 60. I'm starting to feel a lot more comfortable about their risk by age 70. Um, I'm thinking about giving them a high five and I've scanned, I've done calcium scoring up to about age 80. And I think I have, yeah, I have scanned a handful of people at around the age 80, but that's not, that's not common. Is it not possible that you could be 70, have no calcification, but have a lot of soft, soft plaque or does that not really happen? It is possible. Uh, my bigger concern is that you're just taking a picture of the wrong body part. So you can, you know, and, and anyone who's over the age of 70 will tell you the same thing. Doc, I don't really care if I have a heart attack, but man, I am so scared of having a stroke. And so stroke is much more complicated than heart attack. When our patients have heart attacks, 95% of them have them because they have atherosclerosis in their coronary arteries. Stroke, atherosclerosis in the cerebrovasculature accounts for less than one third of the strokes. Stroke occurs also due to high blood pressure, just hypertensive strokes. Uh, you can have embolic strokes due to clots that form in the heart and travel to the brain or little plaque that breaks off from the aortic arch that travels there. And, or you can have strokes that are, are is due to intracranial atherosclerosis. So um, we published a case report of a patient of mine who um, had some other unusual metabolic features, but after she had had her stroke and, and we really defined her intracranial atherosclerosis well with CT angiogram of the brain, um, we demonstrated that she had no observable atherosclerosis in her coronary vasculature or in anywhere else. Her calcium score was zero. She had a lot of intracranial atherosclerosis. So I do sometimes get concerned about under-treating someone or telling them, hey, you know, your calcium score is zero, you're 70 years old, I think you're fine, if they have other features that would suggest they're not fine. So if they have high blood pressure or they're smoking or they have some other thing, 
they're not fine. You, you need to pay attention to their risk for atherosclerosis and other causes of cardiovascular diseases. Is a, a carotid ultrasound, that's what you use, right? Yeah. Is that pretty effective at, at picking up plaque in, in those arteries and, and determining your risk of stroke? Yeah. So the, there's different ways that you can do carotid ultrasound testing. Um, the, the, the most common way to do it is not helpful for looking for atherosclerosis. So you can do Doppler technique, which tells me about the flow in the artery. The carotid arteries though are big, wide diameter arteries, and you have to have a lot of plaque to affect flow. So if somebody says to me, I want to know how much plaque they, I have, and I, and I think to myself, oh, I want to look in the carotid arteries, I can't just order a straight carotid Doppler study that's going to measure flow. That's not going to be the information of interest. So there's another way to look at the uh, carotid, carotid ultrasound. You can use what's called B-mode ultrasound, where you actually look at the, wall, the arterial wall, which is the thing, which is where atherosclerosis develops. And you can get commentary about the presence or absence of, of plaque. Um, and it's, it's quantitative that when you do measurements of the intima to the media, uh, the normal plaque thickness is going to be typically half a millimeter thick. And it, there's some age nomograms that tell me about how it changes. You're talking about like fatty streaks. Like you can see changes over time for sure. But, and if you, for example, have a thicker intimal medial uh, zone than the average person, that may suggest that you're developing atherosclerosis faster. But if you have frank plaque, meaning that the thickness of the, your, your intima media is 1.5 millimeters, done you've answered you've answered the question this person already has plaque regardless of who they are you you should pay attention to that you should treat that that doesn't necessarily mean that their carotid artery is going to be obstructed but it's a marker of atherosclerosis in in a in an arterial bed that is easily accessible by ultrasound and that's cheaper than a ct angiogram it's cheaper than a ct angiogram at our institution we charge the same for the carotid intimal medial thickness as we do for a coronary calcium score just $125. Yeah. I am absolutely excited to share an exclusive offer with the Proof community. This is a limited time offer just for my audience and no doctor referral is needed. Function Health is a comprehensive at-home blood testing service that gives you access to over 100 biomarkers, covering everything from heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health to hormone levels, inflammation, and nutrient status. That, my friends, is five times more testing than the average physical. I chose Function for my own blood work and to be a sponsor of this show because they are the best in the world when it comes to helping you understand and own your health. It's true, the depth and quality of their testing is unrivaled. And as regular listeners of this show will know, you cannot optimize what you don't measure. Don't guess, test. Use Function to know exactly where your health is today, and then intervene with evidence-based medicine and lifestyle changes to feel your best and reduce your risk of chronic disease. With Function, you get access to very important markers like LP little a, a genetically driven cardiovascular risk factor, APOB, the most predictive marker of atherosclerosis, and LH and FSH, reproductive hormones typically missing from standard lab panels. It's not uncommon for these biomarkers and others to be elevated. For example, over 50% of Function members have an APOB level, and over 20% have an LPA little level that is above the optimal range. You can even add on harder to access tests like cystatin C, a very sensitive marker of kidney function, as well as selenium and iodine nutrients that are essential for thyroid and overall health, yet rarely tested. So what are you waiting for? Run over to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill today and be one of 1000 listeners to score a $100 credit. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. 